Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for this Business and Community Alliance presentation, Eco-Friendly Home and Business, Making Your Properties More Attractive to Wildlife and Creating a Healthier Environment. Uh, this session will be recorded and available to you on our Chamber website free of charge. Um, if you needed to reference the presentation again or share with any colleagues or friends. So we're really happy to be providing this free of charge to our members. Thanks to the generosity of our sponsor, Kraus Anderson Construction. So we're very grateful to them. And I'm also delighted to introduce our speaker today, Uva Kausch. He's the Director of Aftermarket and New Business Development with Barco Hydraulics. Uva is a lifelong Duluthian with an education in biology and wildlife management. So this is perfectly fitting within that. And we really thank you for presenting for us today, Uva. And um, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. All right, well, thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity, I guess. Um, when uh, our HR director, um, Asked, or asked us if we want to do a presentation. This was something I kind of always wanted to do because um, there's a real disconnect I feel between a lot of businesses and in homeowners for that, that matter and, uh, and wildlife. And um, as you know, Duluth is, a, is an area where we do get a lot of wildlife in the area, but there's a lot of things that uh, you know, homeowners and businesses in, in the area could do to help improve um, wildlife habitat. Um, uh, beside, I was born and raised in Duluth. I got the weird name from uh, German parents who immigrated uh, uh, from Germany. And, uh, but I'm a lifelong uh, Duluthian. I worked for the DNR for, uh, in French River for eight summers uh, growing up. We raised timber wolves. We had all kinds of animals we grew up with. And um, uh, as Chris mentioned, I went to, you know, uh, went to school as a biology major to Gustavus and uh, couldn't find a job basically uh, um, out of the gate. So um, I got my teaching license as well. Couldn't find a teaching job at the time, it's mid eighties. Uh, jobs are really tough to find back then. Um, and my boss at Ace Hardware downtown Duluth, he, uh, he uh, knew of somebody that worked up at Labonte in two harbors. So I ended up working there. Uh, I thought I was gonna work there for three months or so until I got a teaching job. I ended up there wor working there for 19 years. I uh, knew nothing of the business when I started off, absolutely nothing. And, uh, but they made it interesting. I had to travel all over the world with them. And so it was fun. Um, and then I went over to Built Right for 10 years and now I'm over at Barco for two. So with uh, no further ado, I'll get going. So just to give you kind of an overview, this is our property. Uh, um, we live between Duluth and two harbors. We bought 40 acres uh, back in 97. Uh, as you can see, most of it's wooded. The open area was an old farmstead and uh, basically just a field um, had grasses and some invasive uh, um, uh, plants in there. So over time, what I did is well, I basically cleared some of the brush. So the open areas you see was, is uh, what, was, what was brushy. Um, I left all the trees, any trees that were growing, I left them alone and then uh, cleaned out all the brush. And then I, we ended up building four wildlife ponds uh, on the property and uh, with great success as far as uh, attracting, uh, attracting wildlife. Uh, but my, one point I really want to make is you don't need 40 acres to improve your habitat for wildlife. You can do something as small as a little garden, um, uh, rock garden, a uh, little water feature, whatever. So, but just would give you a little more of a, a background here. So, um, we also have a lake cabin up by near Cotton, and I've done some projects on here, which I'll talk about. So just a reference, this is uh, um, in uh, just east of Cotton on Lake Wilson near East Bass and West Bass, um, about six miles east of Cotton. Also, I had the uh, privilege of working at the Two Hours High School when that was being built, uh, worked with LHB, um, architect firm right here in Duluth. And... Uh, um, help them with some water uh, runoff features, basically to help uh, uh, not only in, it make some wildlife habitat, but it took the water runoff from the building and the parking lots and directed into a shallow area where we planted a bunch of wetland plants to help filter any pollutants coming off the parking lot. And as you can see down in the uh, in this far southeast corner, we built a uh, pond that is used today as this kind of a science study area. So there's, it's, it's a little bit deeper water. So uh, ducks, birds, you know, all kinds of birds come in there and, 
and frogs and so forth so the kids could do well uh, um, studies on that. So that was kind of a fun project. That was in the early, I can't remember when the school was built, I think it's 2005 or so. Um, so basic rules, um, just if, you know, you will not succeed if you don't try, just try something. You know, if you can, if it's simple as planting a tree um, this year, um, you know, just go out and try something. Um, if your project does not attract wildlife, make some changes. Uh, utilize available resources. There's a ton of stuff on the internet. There's a ton of stuff, you know, uh, uh, locally as well. Uh, the big one here is diversify. No monocultures. Don't plant one species of, you know, if you're going to plant trees, 10 trees, don't make it all one tree species. You know, do 10 different tree species. Uh, plants or uh, animals as insects and birds, mammals, uh, fish, everything. They, uh, some are very specific to what they feed on, what they find for shelter, what they find for nesting. So the key is to diversify as much as you can, plant different stuff. Um, there's, again, there's some insects. Uh, I'll talk about the monarch butterfly a little bit, but uh, very specific to uh, specific plants. So diversify. Seek advice. There's plenty of people out there, out there that'll give you some advice. Uh, monitor your site. Uh, maintain your site, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit. It's a lot easier to maintain than, than you might think. Oh, stay away from uh, chemicals, herbicides, and pesticides, and bite off what you can chew. Okay, don't take a project on that, you know, all of a sudden you become overwhelmed. And, you know, so just start off with a project that you think you can um, accomplish in a reasonable amount of time, and then you can always add on. I mean, I, it took me many years to uh, turn my property into what I have today. And I'm still working on it every day. So I was out planting trees yesterday. So uh, first, the bad news, um, talk about kind of where we're at in the current state in, in North America, then a little bit about uh, butterfly and bee gardens, uh, wildlife, wildlife friendly trees and shrubs, lake shores, uh, ponds, uh, wildlife structures, our uh, Barco experiment, what I'm doing uh, at Barco, and then what my cameras caught. I just got some pictures at the end. I, I put out a wildlife cameras and um, I share those on Facebook all the time, but uh, um, but some cool stuff that, that I've had come through my yard. So first, the bad news, uh, since 1970, we've lost 68% of our wildlife. And you think about that, you know, whether you're, you know, this is worldwide. But 68% in that time, you know, the human population has gone from two and a half billion up to 8 billion people. And there's a direct correlation, of course, because we need more land for agriculture. We're polluting more, having bigger impact on what, what is left as far as, uh, you know, nature, uh, natural areas. So there's been a huge, you know, that's a huge uh, number. 2.9 billion birds have disappeared in North America alone since 1970. You know, you think about that, that's, I mean, that's a lot, a lot of, a uh, lot of birds gone. What kills birds in the wild? Uh, a lot of people are very surprised about uh, cats are the number one killer of birds, you know, migrating uh, through each year. Um, and then there's also collisions with, uh, with buildings, collision with vehicles, uh, poison, electrical lines, electrocutions, and then collisions with land-based uh, wind turbines. You can see the turbines are, yeah, they're a factor, but not nearly what any of these others are. Um, I tell people about cats. If you're going to have a cat, they're great pets, but keep them indoors. Uh, they have no business being outside because they are a killing machine. Um, I hear people, oh, I need a barn cat. No, you don't need a barn cat. Put out a mouse trap if you try to get rid of mice, but uh, don't just take a cat and throw it out in your barn. Uh, they're very, very destructive. Oops. Um, turn the lights down or off. This was just an example I pulled. Uh, this was in, in Texas, I, um, in Galveston. Uh, this was in Galveston, Texas. And uh, just by changing the lighting structure of the building at night, the one on the left had a lot of collisions. Uh, birds get confused when there's bright lights out, when they're migrating. Um, so what they did is they turned the lights down, like, on, like the picture on the right and they reduce their uh, collisions with birds dramatically. So just something simple that you can do that, uh, you know, just to reduce the mortality. We do have a problem with invasives. Two species here I picked out were the European starling and the English sparrow, or uh, European house sparrow. Um, they are cavity nesters. They, uh, they, need, uh, uh, they nest in trees. And the 
like the little sparrow looks like a nice little bird, but uh, they will actually take a, a tree swallow or a bluebird and and kill it and evict it from the uh, from the house. So uh, to get at that that nest cavity and uh, they're they're destructive little pests. So um, so we do have invasives, and that's another big factor as to you know why the population of our other native birds have dropped. These are non-protected, by the way. You can you can do with what them what you want. You can destroy the nest, which I I do on occasion at, at my home. Um, here's a graph showing the decline of monarch butterflies, and this is kind of a trend for pollinators in general. Uh, but you can see, you know, from just 1994, 95, these are the butterflies that winter down in uh, Mexico. And I think you guys, you know, probably seen these pictures where they're just loaded onto trees and so forth. But you can see the steady, steady decline of monarch uh, butterflies. Here's a uh, uh, graph showing the, the decline of insects in general. So caddisflies, uh, a lot of beetles, mayflies, dragonflies, stoneflies, those are all, all aquatic in their um, larval stage. So they grow up in the, in the water and then they emerge um, to, to mate, um, you know, and then lay eggs again in the water. You can see a huge decline in, in the aquatic uh, um, uh, bugs, but also the terrestrial ones like butterflies, other beetles, uh, bees in particular is a huge problem currently and uh, just a huge decline. We don't have insects. A lot of people don't like bugs, you know, but we don't have insects. Uh, our environment is goes down the tube because we can't pollinate our, uh, the fruits and vegetables that we, we rely on for food. So what can we do to make a positive uh, impact? So um, one is butterfly and bee gardens. The huge benefit there is providing pollinators, birds, small mammals, with for a uh, source of food and shelter. And again, any size is beneficial. They can be as small or simple as planter boxes on your terrace if you're living in an apartment or cover large acreage. Um, you know, and, and again, it doesn't take take lo a lot to attract some 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 wildlife. So if you live in an apartment, you know, you can do something on your terrace, but maybe you can talk to your landlord too. I I, you know, drive by a bunch of apartment buildings and they have nothing but Kentucky bluegrass and really a sterile, sterile environment. They could make that much, much more attractive to wildlife. Um, I take my, uh, my meadow that I have with wildflowers and I mow it once a year in the fall. So I don't, I have much less burning of, uh, of gasoline. And by the way, mowers, uh, your lawnmower uh, emits 11 times as much pollutants as a new car. So reduce the amount of grass. I mean, sure, I, and I've got, I've got grass at home as well. We throw the football around with the kids, whatever. So we have an area that's mowed and our front yard's mowed. But I try to re reduce that as much as I can. And I've got a lot of uh, you know, trees and, and some uh, uh, rock gardens and so forth. So uh, just try to reduce some of your, your lawn. Uh, you use less water. Uh, these plants have, uh, uh, you know, prairie plants have deep roots and and grasses, uh, they have deep root systems and they increase the, the soil's capacity to hold water because their, their roots are a lot uh, um, longer. They go into the soil a lot deeper. So they're much better at retaining water. And then there's no need for fertilizers, herbicides or pesticides. Once you get them established, there's really nothing you need to do other than, like I said, I mow mine or you can burn areas and obviously you want to burn in, in town or anything like that, but just mow it once a year. So I just picked this as an example, just off the internet, uh, but here's a, here's a beautiful home uh, somewhere, um, but it's a really sterile environment. You've got a, most likely it's a non-native uh, blue spruce that's in the foreground. You got some shrubs in the back, you know, with, uh, along the house that, yeah, that could be some shelter for some wildlife, but in between you got a huge spans of Kentucky bluegrass and I can tell that that thing's been, uh, you, you know, chemicals have been used on that because you don't see anything else but blades of Kentucky bluegrass. Here's some examples of some homes that have done done some things in their front yard, and these aren't big homes. You can tell there's uh, you know they're in a regular neighborhood, looks like Lakeside or anywhere else, um, but they've put in some uh, you know some flower gardens in here, and you can tell the the, uh, the wildlife respond immediately. I mean, you'll have insects coming in here with insects. You'll get birds feeding on those insects. Um, if you can do a water feature, water features are awesome. Um, every animal needs water, so you get. Uh, if you have bees, if you you know you raise bees, uh, they need a wa good water source. Um, so having a small water feature of some kind is uh, is a terrific uh, you know terrific terrific addition to your uh, to your garden. 
So what's wrong with Kentucky bluegrass? Uh, first of all, it's an invasive species. It was introduced from Europe. It's considered an ecological desert with little wildlife value, except Canada geese, which, you know, if you golf uh, um, anywhere in any of our golf courses here in the city, you're going to notice that there are Canada geese out there. Canada geese are a, um, uh, they are a lover of short grass prairie. So that's what they evolved on. So the short grasses that they can see, they like, you know, they like to watch for predators. They don't like tall grasses. They don't like the woods. Um, they like short grass uh, uh, situations. So when you mow a big expanse of lawn like that, that's just, uh, you know, that's McDonald's to them. So they love the short grasses. So uh, Kentucky bluegrass also requires a lot of maintenance, you know, mowing, fertilizer, herbicide applications. So the more fertilizer you put down, the faster the grass grows, the more you got to mow it. And the more herbicides you put down, because you saw a dandelion out there, um, that that uh, not only kills the plant, but you know you got rob, you do have some robins feeding on it. You got the geese feeding on it. You got your dog running on there. You got your kids running on there. And then eventually, if you get a heavy rain, that those chemicals run into the water system, and in Duluth, it'll end up in Lake Superior. So, um, and they Kentucky bluegrass is a very shallow root system, so you got to water it continually, especially when it's dry. Otherwise, it's going to die out on you because those roots just don't go that that deep in the soil. So uh, again, I pretty much covered this, but you know, this stuff, this weed and feed that you put on your, that people put on their lawns, it's uh, bioaccumulative. It's it's a you know it's a poison. Uh, look, that's what it is. So if you can eliminate it as much as possible, uh, um, you know, just just eliminate it because it's just not good stuff. And once you uh, start putting it on, your lawn becomes dependent on it. So you got to keep putting more and more on it, and because you don't have any of the natural uh, uh, bacteria in your lawn anymore to break down organic matter. So in order for that grass to feed, you got to, you know, put these synthetic uh, chemicals on there. So dandelions, I hear the war of dandelions. People, oh my God, I got a dandelion. I got to go, you know, wage war. Um, dandelions are also an invasive. They're, they're not from North America. So yeah, they're, I don't uh, encourage people to plant them. But at the same time, just get over it. Uh, dandelions are here. They're an early spring flower. There's a lot of animals that do feed on dandelions. Um, you'll see bees buzzing around on them. You'll see, uh, they see goldfinches eating the seeds. So that there is some nutritional value. Um, uh, people can actually eat, eat the stuff as a salad because they, they do have uh, nutrition. Um, and there's, uh, you know, uh, deer, uh, rabbits, uh, hares, uh, uh, turkeys, a lot of different animals feed on it. It's, it's very nutritious. When I let my horses out, the first thing they go and uh, eat is the, uh, are the dandelions in our yard. So here's a, a pasture that uh, if you saw the overview earlier. This is my home here. And uh, over time, it took, you know, it's taken time. Uh, and there are some invasive plants in here, but I've at least mitigated some of those by planting some more native uh, uh, forbs and flowers and uh, grasses. And this is what it looks like come, you know, come August. Okay. It's a, uh, but the wildlife have really responded. The, the uh, bees, butterflies, uh, in, you know, insect populations have, have really responded well. And again, this could be a, you know, you could do this in lakeside, just do a small patch of it. You know, um, some of the flowers I get, I'll just buzz through these pretty quick. Um, this is Leatris, uh, uh, blazing stars, another uh, name for it. Uh, here's Northern Plains blazing star. And the bees and the butterflies just pound on this stuff. Um, uh, two types of cone flower um, that I have, and you can see, but you know, again, and some of these pictures are actually from my not all of them, but some of the most of these are from uh, my actual uh, uh, meadow. The number one plant for monarch butterflies are milkweed. Uh, so common milkweed, which you find in road ditches, and but you find less and less of it. Um, but it's the only plant that monarch butterfly caterpillars feed on, okay? They need this plant. Um, milkweed has actually a toxin in it. And so the, uh, the, the reason why the monarch caterpillar is so brightly colored, it's kind of a warning, uh, it sends a warning out to birds that, hey, I'm not very tasty. So it's, it's bright and bold. And, uh, uh, but that's the only thing that they feed on is, is uh, milkweed. Milkweed's really easy to grow. You, and once you find those seed pods in the lower left there, um, in the fall, about October-ish, before they open up, you can grab those seed heads and, and, uh, and then start planting them around your, your garden. 
it's a nice plant. Um, I think you've got a video here. Oops, play or not. So, hey Chris, is there a way to get? Uh, can I get these um, these these cleared these boxes with the? Because I can't see my whole screen. I'm, I'm sorry. What are you looking for? The, the box. The people are that are on here. I, it covers up the part of the uh, the presentation here. I can't where I can't see it. Oh, you should be able to drag it. Okay. All right, sorry, Paige, I'm gonna drag you off my screen here, but oops. Well, there we go. That's the How's that? I yeah. do have a question when you have a moment, Uva. Sure, go ahead. Sure, so this was submitted in the chat from Kara. She says that they've planted a pollinator garden and it's been very successful. Um, and they don't treat their lawn with anything and let the dandelions go wild, but their neighbors are spraying and treating their lawns all summer long. So will those chemicals reach their their yard? Does That's that a very good question. So it kind of depends on the day. Um, certainly, you know, if they're if they're uphill from you and you're just and they're putting on the weed and feed. Um, yeah, that I mean, when it rains, that stuff goes downhill, you know, with water and and, you know, dissolves in water and it will roll downhill, so to speak. If they're spraying, you know, that mist, if it's a windy day, that could definitely carry over into your uh, into your yard. Um, you know, the best thing is to talk to your neighbor and just say, you know, uh, get, you know, and, and I know it's hard because you got to kind of give them a, you don't want to sound like you, you know everything and you're trying to tell them to do something, but just, you know, let them be aware that these chemicals are just, uh, you know, they're, they're nasty, you know, and, and uh, so the answer to your question is, um, yeah, it can, it, it can come over to your, your place, but it kind of depends on the, you know, the day you, if you're spraying again and where the wind's going and then, um, you know, if you're uphill or downhill from, from that person. So, um, but good question. So here's some more milkweed. Uh, here's a quick little video I took, but there's a monarch uh, caterpillar. So monarch caterpillar or uh, butterflies also love the flowers. There's tons of stuff on these flowers. So it's not just the uh, monarchs that like them. There's, uh, I see a lot of bees on them, flies. There's a lot of different pollinators that come in and feed on the, uh, milkweed uh, flower. Oops. Uh, here's some swamp milkweed. Um, it's, uh, as its name says, they, it grows around our pond. So we have, uh, it likes the wetter soils, but also a great plant. Um, wild bergamot uh, called bee balm in, uh, in nurseries. Terrific plant for uh, hummingbirds, uh, bees, uh, butterflies. Great plant. It's a, it's, and it's a cool looking plant. And then just the old fashioned uh, goldenrod. We've got um, uh, we've got a lot of goldenrod in our, in our meadow, and and a uh, um, lot of stuff feed on on goldenrod. And that's very easy to if you don't have it, it usually comes in by itself, and and uh, otherwise uh, seeds are readily available for that. This is uh, uh, false sunflower. I get a lot of that growing. Uh, these, so this is stiff sunflower. Uh, it's a, it's the wild form of, you know, the sunflowers that are domesticated, much smaller flower, but they produce um, sunflower seeds, just like the cultivated varieties. And every year you got, uh, you know, I've got goldfinches, uh, chickadees, uh, you know, feeding on the, on the seeds. And then they also attract a ton of insects uh, while they're flowering. Here's uh, um, yellow or gray headed coneflower. Um, I actually got some seed from a wildlife refuge done in uh, St. Paul and uh, planted at my old place. That was you know, gonna be 30 years ago now. And, and those seed, these are the, these are the uh, um, offspring of those initial seeds that I, I took. Um, Royal catch fly, it's a real bright uh, red flower. Uh, sky blue aster. Um, what I like about these plants is they, uh, they bloom late into the summer and early fall. So it's one of the last, uh, um, last flowers to bloom, but it provides a good nectar source for the, the uh, late season insects as well. Uh, Black eye Susans, I have a ton of those. Um, prairie sundrops, I don't know how this plant got to our yard, but um, in our meadow, but I've got a nice patch of it. It's, uh, a uh, nice flash of yellow as you drive up our driveway. Uh, blue wild indigo, 
taller plant, um, also a, a good source of nectar for uh, hummingbirds and, uh, and bees. Uh, wild rose, um, terrific plant again for, uh, uh, for the pollinators. In the fall, they produce those rose hips, which you can eat, um, but a lot of wildlife feed on them as well. Bears will eat it, uh, deer will eat them. And uh, so it provides a fruit for, for them at the, uh, the end of the year. Uh, this is dogbane. I've got some of this growing in my front garden. I have no idea where it came from or how it got there, but uh, I don't know if I got the video here, I can show you. Yeah. This is a Virginia uh, Tanucha moth, real colorful moth. And I get it, they just love this stuff. I get tons of them on uh, this dogbane every year. So, oops. Uh, Michigan lilies. We've got, I don't know, probably 30, 40 plants growing along our driveway, but a really cool looking flower. So what I wanna do part of this presentation, where can you get this stuff? So uh, Prairie Restorations, um, they are, they have got several locations in Minnesota, but they're, um, they've got one location in Cloquet um, off the Munger Shaw Road. And, um, you know, so right, you know, local business and so support them. I bought, uh, I actually bought some trees from them. It's called Boreal Natives is their, their branch where they sell trees, but um, a good company to, to, to work with. They have some good quality stuff. So again, local company. Uh, Ion Exchange, they're out of Iowa. I've got, have had good luck with their stuff as well. And then another local uh, place called Prairie Natives up in uh, Two Harbors. Um, Dan Schutte is a former uh, environmental ed teacher at North Shore, so I got to know Dan a little bit. Um, but uh, in, He's had a pretty good, successful little business. I, I understand uh, selling uh, native native flowers. So three good uh, sources, two that are, are very local. Um, so an excellent uh, resource for uh, finding plants. So some wildlife uh, friendly shrubs and trees. There's a huge variety. I'm just taking a few here that uh, just as a, you know, kind of examples. Um, a terrific tree to have is uh, American basswood. Um, cultivated varieties are called linden. You'll see those in the, uh, you know, but try to get the, um, I, I, I like to have just the natural native uh, basswood and boreal natives has, has this tree. So I planted this tree, I don't know, about 10 years ago or so. And uh, basswood produces a number of flowers each, um, each spring and they are loaded with bees. They, uh, bumblebees love that flower. Um, if you stand underneath it um, in a spring day when it's blooming, it's just buzzing. It's a great tree to have in your yard. It's a good shade tree. Um, some of the best trees to plant in your yard are, are, are oaks. I've had the best luck with pin oak and bur oak. I've got some wild bur oak that, you know, just came in naturally into my property. Um, but I've planted some pin oak, had good luck with those. Red oak I've had, for whatever reason, I've had some die back or, or they just died, the trees died. Uh, but pin oak seems to do pretty well. Acorns are like a number one food source for a number of uh, um, animals, say wood ducks, uh, turkeys, uh, deer, bear, a um, lot of animals feed on, on the, of course, squirrels um, will feed on acorns. So terrific tree to have in your yard. Here's the bur oak, kind of a scraggly looking uh, tree, um, but also very valuable for wildlife. This is a, uh, I'd call it more of an ornamental. Ohio Buckeye is really not native to Minnesota, but it's just east of us. It's in Wisconsin. And uh, I tried one. Um, uh, it was a, a nursery, it was here, uh, south of London Road. I can't remember the name of it. And then they moved up to Jean Duluth Road. But um, the, uh, the uh, Ohio Buckeye produces uh, clusters of flowers like you see on the left. And that's also a really terrific uh, pollen source for a lot of insects and it, it uh, it blooms early in the year, so it's a really good source for of pollen for you know for bees and uh, other pollinators. Uh, hummingbirds hit them hard, hit them pretty hard too. Black cherry, I have planted a couple of these at uh, my cabin. They're like twenty feet tall now and and uh, doing very well, but they produce some nice flowers uh, again for pollinators. And then in the fall, uh, berries, plenty of berries to eat for the for uh, birds. One of my favorite is mountain ash. Mountain ash is a, a fairly fast growing, it's a smaller tree, um, but they produce these uh, flowers in the spring and then these cluster of red berries. And uh, I remember when I was a kid, we had a large mountain ash in our front yard and, and I remember counting uh, 23 grouse there one morning. 
uh, eating these berries. These uh, top two pictures here on the left, I actually took, that's in our front yard. Um, it's a young cedar waxwing feeding on, on those berries. So they don't last long. The birds see them and they, they pound them down pretty good. They're very nutritious for those birds and uh, a very good food, uh, food source for them. Also in your plantings, if, if you're planting trees, um, I encourage you to plant some, uh, some conifers as well. Uh, they provide some cover, in, especially in the winter time. So I have a white cedar that grows right outside my window that I planted uh, uh, years ago. And that tree now is about 18, 20 feet tall and it's loaded with birds every day because I have my feeders too close to it, but they like it because of the uh, denseness of it and they can get good shelter in there. So uh, white cedar is a great tree to have and uh, red squirrels will eat the seeds uh, very readily. Uh, white pine, if you're looking for a larger tree, white pine is our, you know, it's a native tree and uh, the North Shore was uh, loaded with white pine at one time before logging, uh, took most of them out but uh, a terrific tree to have as well. And the red pine and then uh, jack pine. Jack pine is kind of a scraggly tree. Um, it's one that will first grow up after a fire. They're uh, very shade intolerant, so you can't plant them under anything, um, otherwise they'll die. It's kind of a scraggly tree and, and uh, uh, I've seen a lot of robin nests. I've got a couple of trees, robins build nests in them and, and a lot of birds just hang out in there because it's uh, kind of a dense uh, foliage so they can, they can hide in there pretty well. Uh, 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 wild plum, and I planted a number of these. I've got them from the South St. Louis County uh, Water Conservation District. A lot of, lot of blossoms in the spring, and then you get the plums in the fall, which again are, are very valuable to uh, wildlife. You can also make jellies out of them. Um, I haven't yet, uh, I gotta try that, but uh, um, I've got several trees that are they're doing very well, and now they're, they're shooting up um, through their root system, they, they're called suckers. Uh, making new trees, and I, I've just transplanted a bunch of those uh, uh, around my property. Uh, crab apple is one of the best trees to plant. So you get the wild prairie crab apple. Um, um, I've got a couple that are just growing a wild in, on my property. And then I also uh, I've, I've transplanted or planted uh, you know, some commercially grown crab apple trees. Uh, I like the smaller ones because they're better for the birds uh, versus uh, having the ones that are a little bit bigger. Um, this one produces uh, about the size of a dime. These are uh, a flock of bohemian wax wings that came into, this is right in our front yard. Um, uh, there's the 23 or 24 bohemian wax wings that came in last winter and, and fed on these, uh, on these, uh, uh, these small apples. Um, I've had pine grosbeak, robins, uh, bluebirds, and I know grouse, um, you know, feeding on these, uh, feeding on these apples. So some shrubs that are really valuable. Um, I find uh, uh, elderberries really good. The uh, makes great jam too, by the way. So you can you can eat those berries uh, if you're lucky enough to get them. Because normally the birds, once they ripen, the birds attack and and chow down on those uh, berries real quick. Here's an eastern bluebird feeding on on elderberry. Uh, nanny berry is another uh, shrub. I do. I've had really good luck with these. I've got them from the uh, these from the Soil Water Conservation District and. Uh, and <clears throat> planted them and I've got some mature bushes now and they produce a lot of berries. Uh, one of my favorite is June berry or service berry. You can get them in a tree form. You can also get them in a shrub form. Um, I remember when I was working for the DNR, we worked up in the Gooseberry River and one summer for whatever reason, these things were loaded with berries. We just took handfuls of them and, and ate them raw. They uh, taste something between a, a, a blueberry and an almond kind of mixed together. They're kind of a nutty flavor. They're, they're really, really good. Uh, cranberry bush, and get these at most nurseries, but again, produce some red berries and, um, you know, eaten by birds. Um, just want to touch base, because if you make a, uh, a wildlife planting, like say you plant the uh, wild crab apple or whatever, then there's no reason why not, to, you know, for, for our use, plant some, uh, you know, plant some fruit trees. Uh, Honeycrisp apple is one of my favorite. Uh, I, I have pretty good luck. I've got really heavy uh, wet or uh, red clay soil. And uh, sometimes it's really hard for stuff to grow in that, in that soil, but uh, I've had good luck with Honeycrisp apples. And uh, in the springtime, the blossoms provide, you know, the uh, cedar wax means will actually eat blossoms. So they'll eat some blossoms. They're not gonna take all of them off there, but, um, but they're a good pollen source for uh, insects. And then later on, the fruits are awesome because they, they ripen in, uh, in just about first of October. 
And then the, the cool thing about them is you can throw them in the fridge and they'll last for a couple months without getting soft. So they last a long time. And, and uh, for two and a half months, I have fresh uh, uh, organic apples at work every day. Uh, pear trees do well up here too. I've had good luck with pear. They produce a copious amount of blossoms in the spring. And I've got some couple of mature ones that uh, produce a ton of pear. Oops. I'm gonna try for the first time, uh, um, I just planted a contender peach. I guess they do well up here at zone four. Um, and I'm gonna give them, a, give them a whirl. And I've got some royal plum. I've got those wild plum growing uh, right next to the, uh, the royal plum. So it provides, provides good cross pollination source. And <clears throat> they just started producing fruit, uh, fruit last year. Uh, the bitter cherries, um, they're more tart than bitter. Um, I love them, just eating them raw. But there's, there's a couple different varieties. North Star cherry is uh, pretty popular up here. Uh, lilac, I wouldn't normally promote lilac because it is a non-native, but it does attract um, some wildlife. This is a hummingbird moth I caught on ours in the front yard. Besides the fact my wife would kill me if I knocked, if I took this thing out because she loves uh, um, lilacs and it, it's kind of a cool, uh, cool shrub. So, and it doesn't really spread, you know, very much like, uh, like buckthorn, um, some really invasive plants. It pretty much stays where you've planted it. So it's, it's not, not terrible. So here again is a good uh, source for buying these plants. It's at the South St. Louis County Soil and Water Conservation District. I've got the website on here if you guys, uh, you just Google it, but get your plants early. Um, they start usually in first part of February, and then um, within a couple of weeks, they're sold out. So if you want plants, uh, go on there early. But uh, they have good stuff. I just uh, I had just planted the rest of my uh, what I had ordered uh, last week and, and got on Thursday. Just planted everything uh, this weekend. So but it's, it's good stuff. Um, Boreal Natives is uh, the company I was talking to you about. Uh, again, the local company here that sells uh, native trees and shrubs along with prairie plants. So they're a really good source. Um, here's a good resource for um, just planning for wildlife. It's uh, landscaping for wildlife. It was put out by the Minnesota DNR. Oh, it's probably over 20 years ago now, but a real good source of information on how to make gardens and you know, uh, different plants to put in and so forth. So it's a, it's a really good source. So I'll move on to some uh, ponds, wetlands, and, and lake shores. <clears throat> this is just a slide from our cabin. We've got a small cabin, like I said, uh, uh, just east of uh, Cotton. And rather than, you know, I, I look around cabin properties and I see a lot of people, oh my God, I got to get rid of every, uh, you know, uh, you know, weed that's out there. So they go rake the rake it or they put uh, copper sulfate in the in the water to kill the, any you know vegetation so they can have a nice sandy beach uh, we elected not to do that we bought this cabin back in 2007 I actually planted some extra stuff in here so we keep you know we keep a space for our dock and then uh, this area over here it's about five six feet wide that we can walk out to our platform and enjoy the water um, you know, just with that, that strip. So it's about 10, 10 foot of, uh, you know, impact on that shoreline, but the rest we just left natural. And the funny thing is, is we're everybody, you know, we're a small lake, it's like a 55 acre lake. And uh, my property and then the two neighboring properties kind of have the same, same setup. And where does everybody fish and I'm fishing for bass, they come to our, our, um, our part of the lake because fish like to hang out in here. You got the insects hang out in here, which smaller fish eat the insects. And then the uh, larger bass and northerns come in to feed on the small fish. So it's a nice little ecosystem and that's where the fish end up hanging out. You, uh, we have a question quick. Sure. If you could only recommend one or two types of bird houses, what would you recommend? And for I will, uh, I'm coming up on that. So I'll, oh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll hit, yeah, great question. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll come up on that here shortly. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Um, so this is our bigger pond on our property back here's our house. So it's fun is, you know, we, what we really enjoy is that from our um, living room window, basically we can watch what's going on in the pond and we see a lot of stuff. So this is our pond. I've put out some wildlife structures here, which I'll talk about. 
Uh, in the springtime, we get tons of frogs. Um, we have five species that regularly are uh, found in our pond, American toad, uh, spring peeper, green frog, gray tree frog, and wood frog. So then first thing in the spring, the wood frogs and the spring peepers are going at it. I've got a little recording here. Hopefully you can hear that. But that was just going off my deck and recording that sound. So those are spring peepers. And if you hear a little grunt in the background, grunting noises, that's the wood frog. And then now in a, the next week or so, we'll start hearing uh, gray tree frogs and they, they're really loud. And then, uh, then the toads will start and they've have kind of a really uh, a trill, uh, kind of a, it's kind of a soothing trill sound. And then the green uh, frog sounds kind of like a bullfrog, just a kind of a large croak. And they're the last ones to, to breed. I've already checked the pond, there's tons of tadpoles uh, swimming around. So they've been successful. Oops. Uh, it's a pair of Canada geese that nested in my pond. I encourage them, or, or I don't discourage them from nesting. Um, what's cool is that with the four ponds I have, there's only one pair that nests there every year. Um, the, the resident pair keep everything else out. So um, it's not like I got, you know, 40 geese, you know, hanging out. And uh, so they'll, they'll raise a family, they'll fly off in the fall, we get to watch them. It's kind of a fun deal. Uh, red winged blackbirds. Blackbirds were, this is probably one of the most populous birds we've, we, we have in North America, but their populations have been dropping pretty drastically as well. Um, so they nest in the cattails. And um, so around my pond, I've got cattails growing. And so I get a, a number of uh, red winged blackbirds. Well, I also throw some sunflower seed out for them. And, and right now we've got just a, a horde of them that are eating the sunflower seeds. And uh, Another cool thing I discovered was we've got white spruce, um, um, you know, smattered throughout our field um, and around the edges of the of the, uh, the meadow that we have. And I noticed that those trees are all doing really, they're doing really well. Well, you walk 100 feet into the woods and the balsam firs and the white spruce are getting nailed by uh, spruce budworm. And spruce budworm are, uh, there's a little brown moth, really kind of nondescript brown moth lays their eggs on these spruce and balsam and then the young caterpillars feed on the uh the new needles coming out so over a course of a couple of years that that tree can't recover and they die so i've got a lot of and, and a lot of people on the north shore right now have a lot of dead and dying uh white spruce and balsam fir but one thing i discovered um is last uh, last summer i noticed there's three female red winged blackbirds walking on a branch and I took out the binocs, see what they're doing, and they're plucking off these caterpillars. And so caterpillars are highly nutritious for birds. And because there's, you know, the squishiness of them makes them also very uh, digestible. So you can imagine if feeding your uh, young bird a, a beetle that has a hard carapace on it, uh, um, you know, that the bird try, has to try to not only swallow, but then digest versus a squishy caterpillar that's loaded with fat and, uh, doesn't have any of that uh, or very little of the undigestible material in it. So anyway, just kind of a cool little symbiotic relationship I, I, I discovered, you know, just by happenstance. So these are some of the, uh, uh, you saw it earlier, that pond um, on the far side, there's a log structure. I put a camera out there this spring. So this is the actual picture. This is a picture I took off the internet, just to kind of give it more uh, color, I guess. Excuse me. I a little water. Um, so I just put it in one spot and just see what happens. So uh, here we go. These are a pair of blue winged teal, um, small duck. They're, they are the funnest duck to watch fly because they can fly. Also the green winged teal, same thing. Uh, very small duck, um, uh, very, very good flyer. Here's the wood duck. And if you've seen a, ever seen a wood duck up close, probably the prettiest colors you're ever, ever gonna see. A ring neck ducks, they come in every spring. Uh, here's a ring neck duck with a mallard. Here's the male mallard. They're nesting on our, on our, uh, on our property. One thing I caught, uh, this was just a couple of weeks ago, I, I checked the camera and here's an otter feeding on a, a frog. And I've never seen an otter in our ponds. We're about a third of a mile away from the Sucker River and otters normally hang around rivers. But he must have gone, he just went overland and, and uh, came in for a snack. 
I haven't seen them since, but uh, those are really neat sighting and never had one on my uh, pond that I know of um, before. So that was kind of cool. Um, greater yellow legs, it's a, a shorebird that comes through every spring. Uh, long yellow legs on it, pretty good sized shorebird, neat bird. And the Canada goose, of course. Uh, here's a pied billed grebe, um, small bird. He'll, he'll dive down and, and feed on uh, uh, tadpoles and uh, uh, insects. And uh, there's a uh, uh, amphipod called uh, uh, gamaris. It's a it's like a freshwater shrimp, and they'll they'll feed on them as well. Uh, last week I took this picture. Uh, it's, uh, not the best pictures, but uh, uh, two trumpeter swans came flying in. You're seeing more and more trumpeter swans in northern Minnesota, which is great. These guys were wiped out in our state and uh, uh, commercial hunters killed them in the early 1900s. And then they were brought back. We've got some eggs from Alaska back, I think it was in the 80s. And uh, they started uh, you know, uh, planting them around different uh, areas in the state. And now if you drive from, if you take the northern route over to Fargo, North Dakota, just about every uh, <clears throat> wetland or small lake will have a pair of trumpeter swans in them, which is great to see. You get to see them fly, they're just, they're unbelievable, they're just cool. Took this picture on Saturday. This is a uh, green heron that just popped in and, you know, so you can see these ponds and they don't have to be big again. If you, if you have the land, if you have the ability to do it, I uh, highly encourage a pond uh, to, you know, to build a pond because you get the wildlife. It's just a lot of fun to watch come in. Here's some resources for some plants. If you want to buy uh, uh, wetland plants, you got to be careful about collecting them in the wild because there are some non-natives non out there, invasive plants. So you want to make sure you plant the right stuff. Um, so if you know what you're looking for, fine in the wild, but uh, otherwise you get some sources here that some nurseries that actually grow uh, wetland plants. So here's a couple of them here um, as a resource. Uh, the DNR has put out a great book again, uh, Landscaping for Wildlife and uh, Water Quality. Um, so that's a great resource for you as well. So we'll get into some log structures and I hopefully I'll get, the, uh, I'll get through the nest structures here. Um, so I'll blow through these uh, pretty quick here because I know you guys are um, we're strapped for time a little bit. So these are log structures I put in. Here's over that camera uh, where I took all those pictures. Here's a, a mallard nest structure. And then I took these logs. I had to thin out a, a section of red pine. They were growing too close together this last winter. So I cut some of those trees down, removed the branches, looked, dragged the logs over the uh, pond. And while it was on ice, so it was easy to, um, to uh, get them out there, I, I ended up building this log structure. And, that was where, and that's where you see all the animals hanging out, or the, the ducks and so forth hanging out on the logs. Oops. And here again, there's another log, another log structure. So nest boxes. So the answer to your question, I guess, kind of depends on where you live. Um, if you live in open area, uh, bluebirds and tree swallows are very easy to attract. Okay, so that'd be my number one if you live in an open area. If you live in a wooden, wooded area, then you can go after a great crested flycatcher, um, chickadees. Although chickadees actually come out, you know, they'll come out and I've had them nest in my front yard. Chickadees are very uh, secretive nesters. They don't, uh, you know, for how close you can get to them when they're coming out the feeder, they really don't like to show off where they're nesting. So they're a little more shy. Um, but, uh, um, but uh, you know, obviously it's a woodland bird for the most part. So they'll, they'll nest in boxes as well. Um, if you're near water, uh, wood ducks are pretty easy to, to uh, attract. And so our hooded mergansers, I'll, uh, I'll just go through this here and kind of talk about that. But so a couple styles of boxes for bluebirds and tree swallows. This is the Peterson style box. I like this style because um, English sparrows, English sparrows, uh, the non-native bird I was talking about earlier, they build a, it's a weaver finch and they build a, a nest that's uh, very circular. And it's just a big hairball of uh, grasses basically. And they don't like this, uh, this style because it wedges down to the bottom. It doesn't give them the opportunity to make that big, you know, hairball nest. So it kind of <clears throat> discourages them from nesting. Uh, bluebirds and tree swallows love this type of nest, though, and they will readily, you know, readily nest uh, in this box. But there's also the, the standard style. So I built um, this box down here and this right here, same, same box. 
you can see the little tree swallows in here. This is actually at Barco. This is Barco back here. I put five boxes up last uh, last spring. Uh, we have an open area. We're right on the harbor um, in Superior here. So this is for the tree swallows. But tree swallows are really easy to to uh, attract if you have an open area, and especially near water. They love water. But um, if you just if it's just open area, you'll, chances are you'll get a, a good chance of getting uh, getting some tree swallows. And if you don't have water in the area, you, you know, just again put a small uh, um, just a water feature in your in your yard. You know, would be great. Uh, hopefully, I answered that question. If you got anything specific there, um, you know, let me let me know. Um, Barn swallows are pretty easy to track. If you got an old barn, that's uh, the, hence the name. Uh, they'll nest under eaves of buildings, so you can put these little platforms out, and they'll uh, they'll read readily use these uh, platforms. But it's got to be under an eave. They like to be underneath something. So, um, as do uh, cliff swallows. Cliff swallows make their own nests out of mud. When I was a kid, the uh, the deck arena had hundreds of cliff swallow nests underneath the uh, uh, it's kind of that v-shaped pattern on the on the deck as you go around but there used to be hundreds of nests and I think they you know they kept uh, knocking them off because they didn't want them nesting there and I haven't seen a colony or any nest attempts on that building for a long time but but uh, so these populations are are uh, dwindling as well of, of cliff swallows so if you can give them a um, some in eve this, this is a little bit of a um, just kind of a, a platform that they can start their nests on. So they'll nest on, you know, start building their uh, their mud nest on a, a little platform like that. So, uh, but they are colony nesters. They got to nest together. Robins and the little Phoebe, they nest on little uh, platforms. You can, again, put these underneath your eaves or your all <clears throat> underneath an eave in your house or garage. Um, keeps them away from predators. And they will readily nest there. So if you again, if you live in an urban environment, another uh, easy bird to get to nest is our, is your you know your American robin. Um, and then then Phoebe's are there's quite a few Phoebe's around as well. So they'll they'll readily nest there. Black capped chickadees they're also a cavity nester, and they will take the boxes uh, uh, as well. Uh, easy way to tell on what's nesting and what if if it's just the uh, you're looking at the eggs um, or just the nest itself. Chickadees always have uh, moss. Uh, they use moss for nest lining their nest and really fine hair. Um, tree swallows will have white feathers. They like uh, they line their nests with white feathers. Uh, bluebirds will be just a kind of a grassy uh, cup nest. Um, and then, like I said, those English sparrows will have that big, you know, huge nest that covers everything. And uh, so I, I can tell readily if it's a what bird it is by just the nest material that they use and and uh, go, you know. Uh, act appropriately. One of my favorite birds is the American kestrel. This is actually a picture off, <clears throat> off of my property. Just to show you what they, the habitat that they like. House back there. But they're a bird of, a bird of open area. So this is that meadow. And I just put a, uh, old, there's an old uh, power pole in the middle of the field. And then uh, every year I get to uh, go up and band them. So I know a local bander in Duluth, uh, Dave Evans, and he comes in and bands these every year. So through the last year's young. But these are, uh, uh, they're called sparrow hawks also is the name for them. They're, they're our smallest falcon. Eat mice, grasshoppers, snakes, uh, any kind of small prey. But they're really cool. Oops. Uh, the wood duck, uh, they uh, nest in boxes as well. You saw those on the on the pictures. Um, hooded mergansers will nest in the same box. Um, I've got a pair of nesting right now. I haven't seen a wood duck uh, female yet, but um, they're very sneaky, so they're tough to tough to know if they're they're not sometimes. Um, I built it out of, I built a couple now out of PVC lumber. I got this at Menards. I'm gonna give it a try uh, just for longevity sake because that stuff will last forever. So I'm gonna see uh, how successful using PVC versus cedar. Um, but otherwise use cedar lumber is very good. Make sure it's thick. It's gotta be uh, you know inch lumber, which is actually three quarter inch uh, thick, but don't go any thinner than that. Um, you can put them up on a pole like that or best yet is on over the water like this. 
And then I have an observation thing so I can go in there. You can go in and observe too when they're not sitting on the nest. You don't want to do it a lot, but uh, they're usually pretty tolerant of you coming in. Common merganser, I had uh, on our old place, I had a, a 1.3 acre size pond built and I had common mergansers nesting on there every year. Um, they, you see them out in Lake Superior, out in the harbor a lot, bigger, uh, a bigger duck, but they'll nest inland and uh, they're fun. They're a lot of fun to watch. I've put a, uh, this is a box that I put up uh, in, behind Barco. Um, I'll show you, I'll show you a little more detail here shortly. Uh, mallards also will nest in a man-made structure. This is called the mallard hen house. Basically it's uh, a rolled up uh, hardware cloth. You stuff it full of, full of uh, hay and put it on a flat board and then you put that flat board on a post in the water. And the nice thing about that is uh, it's very tough for a raccoon or a coyote or uh, other predator to come in and, and uh, kill the, uh, you know, kill the hen and, and eat the eggs. So this is a good, uh, uh, if, if you can't do an island in a pond, then this is a really good alternative, so. One thing I haven't tried yet, I'm gonna do this up at the lake, hopefully next year is put up a loon platform. And right now our loons that come in, they nest on the shoreline and everyone, you know, every other year or so, it seems like predators get the eggs. So I wanna try building a platform and throwing it on in the, in the lake and see if I can get a loon to, to nest out there. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like bats, but uh, bats are very beneficial, they eat a lot of insects, especially at night. Um, I've got two bat boxes at the cabin. One night, uh, my son and I were watching, um, it's just in, in the, in the uh, evening, we saw 65 bats come out of that house. And uh, uh, you may have heard that uh, bats are really suffering right now from a disease called white nose fungus, which is found now in Minnesota. It started on the East Coast and working its way west. And it's basically wiped out over, you know, about 95% of the bat populations. Some bats seem to be more resistant to it. Um, last year, I only had a handful of bats using my houses, you know, six to eight um, I'd see in there, but not, not many more than that. Um, whereas previous years, again, I had over 60. So um, hopefully they're going to survive because they, uh, they eat a lot of mosquitoes at night. So one bat can eat, you know, well over a thousand mosquitoes at night. So they're very valuable to have. Um, a great book for uh, uh, doing, you know, wildlife boxes is Woodworking for Wildlife. They give you specific dimensions, you know, what, what wood to use and so forth. So it's a really good resource. It's been out there for quite a long, a long time, but a really good resource. Easy plans to use and doesn't take much to, to build this stuff. The one thing I would encourage you is again, three quarter inch lumber and it's called one inch when you buy it, it's one inch uh, lumber, but it's actually three quarter inch. Um, but use, use thicker lumber and then use galvanized deck screws. Don't use nails and don't uh, buy boxes that have staples on them because what happens is that wood will uh, uh, expand and contract over the year, depending on, on the humidity and um, you know, it's getting rained on or whatever. So that over time it, it expands and contracts and those staples end up pulling out and then the box falls apart. So if you use the deck screws that holds them together really tight and, and uh, um, you know, keeps it, keeps the box together. Uh, raw linseed oil would be a good preservative. You don't need to paint your box. It's just put raw linseed oil on it. It'll, it'll uh, penetrate into the wood. And it's a really good preservative and it still allows the box to gray naturally. Um, and that's what I use. A good resource for just birds in general is Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And um, uh, just a really good resource of telling, you know, the, the life history of a bird, uh, bird, uh, bird species, and uh, just a good resource for you. So here's the bar, here's Barco, here's where I work. Um, we've got a lot of open land, it's right on the water. So like I, I already talked about, I put out a, um, those, those swallow boxes, I put out five of those. And then I'm also, this is not the picture from Barco, but uh, uh, I'm trying to put a, uh, or attract Osprey here. So we did a little project. So Barco is located right across the, uh, the Blotnick Ridge in Superior. Here's a, and then the Northwest corner, we've got kind of a wild area, I'll call it. Um, no, you know, little activity going on there. So I had uh, Superior Water, Light and Power. I applied for a grant and they came out and gave me a brand new uh, pole. They're generous with their time. And then I built the, uh, the platform and uh, my friend Matt here at work and, and myself, we uh, installed this, uh, this platform. And this is what it looks like. 
Now, I haven't had any luck attracting anything yet, but I'm, uh, I'm still hoping. Sometimes it might take a couple of years uh, before something nests up there or attempts to nest, but we'll see. And then I also put this merganser box on that same pole. You can see it right here. Um, and hopefully that'll attract a, a merganser to, to nest there. So I'm gonna check that here in, a, in the next week or so just to see if I'm getting at any activity there. And here's some of the more the other swallow boxes that I plant or uh, of placed around the uh, property. Um, lastly, I'm just going to buzz through this is some of the stuff I've caught in my backyard, whether it took my my handheld camera or my uh, wildlife camera. Um, I get a pair of sandal cranes every year. They do their little dance. These guys have gotten used to me. They come in. They've been here now the last six seven years. I'm pretty sure it's the same pair. Um, they know me, I can go out there and get within eh, 40 feet or so and it doesn't seem to bother them. I give them a little corn once in a while and, and get to watch them every day for about six weeks. They don't nest on here uh, on my property, but they're nesting, I think, at just up the uh, road a little bit in a swamp. Um, but they come and feed uh, at my uh, place all the time. I watch them do their little dance and they actually made it in the, in the field uh, a couple of weeks ago. Oops. Um, ruby throated hummingbirds. I have no problem attracting them with just the plantings I have, but I also give some supplemental food to them. Um, I do some crazy stuff. I'll pick up a deer carcass off the highway and then I'll put a, I'll put it out in the woods and, and, uh, um, uh, just see what comes on it and put a camera on it. Here's a skunk and a red fox that we're feeding on a, on a deer carcass. There's a red fox uh, during the daytime. Uh, here's a gray fox. Uh, gray fox were never up here when I was a kid. They've moved uh, kind of climate change thing is uh, they've moved from southern Minnesota up, up here and it's now a very common uh, fox. It's the only uh, canid, the only dog uh, member that can climb trees. So they'll readily climb trees. They also have a much more varied diet than the red fox does. They eat uh, a lot of fruit, um, but they also, you know, they'll also eat uh, mice and, uh, and uh, rabbits and so forth, but, but they have much more variety of uh, food source. Uh, these are pictures I took last fall, a couple uh, hundred yards from my house. Um, we have a pack of, of wolves that come through and, and we get to see them on a, on a regular basis. Um, but also my camera caught this uh, kind of creamy colored one. They've got a couple of color phases that in this wolf pack. And this beautiful black one here on the right, uh, she came through in the, in the fall. I think it's a female. It's, it's a smaller, smaller wolf, um, but uh, kind of fun. Kind of fun to see. Here's another wolf picture I took uh, a few years back. My house, from this picture, my house is 200 yards that way. So, uh, eagles, I get a ton of eagles, crows, ravens. I actually get the magpies too, which is a Western species of, it's in the crow family. Um, but I get them uh, visiting now in the winter once in a while when I throw a carcass out there. A couple of years ago, I threw two deer, deer carcasses out in our field. Didn't get much wolf or fox activity, but between the ravens, the crows, the eagles, and the turkey vultures, they uh, they cleaned up that carcass, those two carcasses within three days. Uh, Fisher, which is really cool, it's a large weasel, the weasel family. Um, here's a picture of a eagle, turkey vulture, and crow. Um, something dragged that carcass off that night, but and that's about it. So. I went over a lot of stuff. I can, you know, um, just kind of give a kind of an overview, um, but there's some good information in, in, in this presentation. If you'd like, uh, you know, as far as resources go, if any of you guys are interested, I can certainly uh, help you out, send that information to you. Um, hope you enjoyed it. And if you've got any questions, just fire them my way. Thank you, Upa, thank you so much. Quick question. If there was a business in a more urban setting, Right. What would you recommend that they prioritize to maybe can you attract some wildlife to a, it in a more urban setting like what you did at Barco or what you're doing at Barco? Yeah. Um, and when my presentation, I had I had, uh, I had a scramble on my presentation. I actually had a couple more slides in here. Of, of, I took pictures of businesses, but let's just take, um, you know, for example, uh, the hotels down in Canal Park. I go by there, you know, ride my bike or, you know, walk past the those hotels. They have Kentucky bluegrass, not much else there. Um, what I would prioritize first, I guess, is put in a, uh, uh, you know, a flower garden, a native flower garden, a rock garden. Um, and if you can get a water feature in there, just a small water feature would be terrific, you know. 
and like and then the other thing just plant uh you know plant some uh uh a, you know plant a couple mountain ash trees or or a crab apple i would do a crab apple and a mountain ash something like that um you know start um and start small and just keep working you know working towards it get rid of the chemicals and you know i look at like some of these places like a hotel could really take the uh you know, look at Pier B. They've got a they've got a pretty open expanse. So they planted some trees there, but you could almost make like a walkway if you plant, planted some native. You made a little native prairie there, had a walkway through it, had some signage up that said, "Hey, you know, we believe in uh, you know a sustainable uh, um, you know uh, a sustainable environment." And um, you know, they could you could do some on the marketing side. You know, take advantage of that because there's people that want to stay at places that are environmentally conscious. Yeah. And, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, you do. But again, my advice would be start small, put a garden in, put a, a water feature in, plant a couple of trees that are attractive to wildlife, start there and, and, and build from there. Perfect. Thank you. And then two more quick questions from the chat. What are your thoughts about skunks? And then what outdoor camera do you recommend? <laughs> okay. Uh, why? I, I assume a, a trail camera. Um, Probably. But Okay. Uh, well, uh, both of them. I can. So skunks are. All right. I had a uh, give, give an example last summer. My dogs are barking like crazy, and I look out in the garage, and sure enough, there's a skunk. Uh, a skunk uh, there, a young skunk, and and uh, I had a little uh, dog treat, a little milk bone. I gave it because it was the middle of the day, and I knew he wasn't going to go anywhere, so I gave him a little milk bone and took the dogs off them and just leave them alone or, you know, um, they'll, they'll go away. The one thing that skunks do that are very beneficial, you'll see sometimes little holes in your yard, which go, oh, God, that's, you know, I don't want them, but what they're eating is those, uh, the, the June uh, beetles, their larvae, those big, and if you've ever seen those big white, white ugly, uh, cutworms that are in your lawn, that's what they're going after. So they hear them munching on the, on your grass roots and they go digging after them. And they're highly nutritious for them, so that's what they're going after. Um, you know, uh, my dogs have learned the hard way. Hey, stay away from a skunk, stay away from porcupine, whatever. And uh, uh, but you know, you don't want to go pick one up because it could have rabies. You know, but uh, other than that, they're 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 totally harmless. And uh, you know, I'm a leave it alone type of guy. I really don't like uh, um, you know, I, I just leave them alone. And they'll go away. I mean, you know, uh, I raise chickens and I have turkeys and so forth. And you're going to get predators. Anytime you have animals like that, you're going to get, uh, or livestock, you're going to get predators. Provide good housing for them so they can, you can lock them up if you need to. If you have a bobcat or you got a, a coyote or a fox hanging around trying to get at them, trust me, once you lock them up for a few days, they're not going to just sit there and wait for you to open up the gate uh, so those animals can attack. Um, they're going to move on because they need to feed. Okay, so if they can't get at them, they're going to move on. So, perfect. Um, and then, yes, oh, a trail cam. The, the camera. So, the trail cameras, um, I, I've got a Reconyx, which is, it was an expensive camera at the time, it was a $600 camera. But uh, I found just as good luck. I've got that, uh, uh, some of those were taken off a cutty back. Um, but they're all pretty competitive, to be honest with you. So, if you go up to uh, Fleet Farm, they, they have them. Um, you don't need to buy a really expensive camera. Um, you got to, you want to get something that has a flash at night so you can get a really good uh, image. Some of them have really grainy images at night. They're real blurry. Um, but for the most part, the technology has gotten a lot better um, over the last few years. And, uh, you know, in order to be competitive, they all got to be pretty decent, you know. So don't spend, I wouldn't spend $600 on one, but there's plenty of $100 to $200 quality cameras out there. Um, and then as a handheld camera, I've got a Nikon. I got to get a better lens. You know, uh, when I get a stronger lens, I got a, uh, I think it's an 80 to 200 meter, 200 millimeter lens. Um, and, uh, it's okay, but I, I need to have a better lens. So, but I like the handheld. Um, and then your, your lot of phone cameras, if you can get close enough, they do a pretty, pretty good job now. I mean, it's crazy, but, uh, um, but yeah, I, I still like the handheld uh, camera with the longer lens on it. Perfect. Well, this was super informative. Thank you. Yeah, I hope you guys got something out of it. And uh, like I said, if you got any questions, uh, Chris has got my number and my yeah. email. Uh, you're more than welcome to uh, 
to uh, give me a call or send me an email or whatever. So my, uh, actually my phone number is right there on the last slide. So um, Perfect. And my email. Okay. Well, I will follow up with everyone um, in an email with Uva's contact information, as well as a link to the presentation that we've recorded. So we really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much, Uva, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Yeah, thanks a lot. Have a good day, yeah. guys.